Welcome to the Painting Insights podcast. We have been working on something in the background. That's right. We've actually started a Patreon channel. For the last couple of months, we've had previous guests revisit the channel to give us additional content, everything from studio tours, sketchbook tours, talking us through the process of paintings and all kinds of additional treats, which you're exclusively going to see as a patron who supports the channel. So by supporting us on Patreon, you help the channel keep going. There's a lot of work put into this from the video editing to the sourcing of guests. So you really help us find those guests and to put the content out. And we have lots of uh, content planned for the near future. So the links for that will be in the description of this video and in the description on the podcast channels. And otherwise you can go on to Patreon and type in Painting Insights Podcast and support us that way. Thanks very much, enjoy the video. Would you mind introducing yourself for the audience, please? So my name is Ken Mwadiobu. I am a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, I was born and raised in Nigeria. Uh, I just moved to London three years ago. And uh, I have a... uh, I don't know if I should talk about my qualifications, but I have a BSc in civil engineering and I have an MA in art. So kind of like... It'd be of both for science and art together. Oh, that's interesting. So does your civil engineering uh, degree, does that factor in at all into any of your art making in any way? Um, yes, it does. Uh, I found kind of like the most, uh, the easiest way to kind of bring it into my work. Uh, there are more ideas I've had that are very uh, expensive to build and to create, but I've kind of um, found a very interesting way to, you know, have it influence what I make. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I see that some of your work is is amazing structures as well. Like really, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's something to marvel at, I think, as as a kind of spectacle for someone who's entering the space. Um, For anyone who can't see, uh, anyone who's an audio listener, can you describe what your work uh, how the presentation of it or what it looks like for people who can't see it yeah um so i have these two recent body of work i make now um one of them is a stack of boxes right and they're cardboard boxes but they're not just stack of cardboard boxes they are um these boxes are painted um are painted on and they are painted with faces of people who have migrated from Africa to different parts of the world. And it's just a conversation about migration and, you know, what migration means. And, you know, the, you know, even to talk about, you know, how these boxes also migrate and how it's so synonymous to how African immigrants as well migrate to the rest of the world. So, I have that set of, you know, stacked up. And the reason why it's stacked up is because in some way, the the boxes kind of support each other. And when you think of uh, communities that immigrants make in this rest of the world, you see that there's a lot of support between themselves. And it's just talking about the beauty of immigration, the beauty of um, um, of African culture, because these boxes as well are different colors. And when you stack them up, they kind of feel like an African fabric with these different colors. Um, So yeah, that's one of my most um, exciting works. I've made over 200 paintings on the boxes, so 200 boxes in some way. Um, And I've stacked them up in France, in Miami, in London, in in, uh, Singapore, and in so many places I do my exhibitions, in Berlin as well. Um, And then the second body of work is was inspired by this thermographic camera. Um, I used to play with that while I was in school in, as a civil engineer. And we used the camera to kind of look at where there was leakage in pipe. And um, that kind of took my attention. And I, when you use the camera on people, they kind of turn in a different, they, they, they are represented in a different color. 
And I went to talk about energy and how our world is full of energy. So I kind of adopted and took the palette of the thermographic camera. And that palette kind of reminds me of fire or reminds me of the sun or energy in some way. And I used it to make these um, incredible paintings of immigrants who, you know, find their way, you know, who survive and go through all of these issues, um, being in a different country and have staying and um even being in a different culture as well um so yeah so it's uh there's a lot of civil engineering into the work but the work in some way talks about my experience as an immigrant as well uh, we're coming to london i realized that i was not a man i became a nigerian man you know different from when you're in nigeria you're just a man you know, but when you are in London or in New York or you're everywhere, you become a black man or a Nigerian man or an African man. And, you know, that changed my perspective a lot. And I wanted to understand what that meant for my to my identity, what that meant to me and what that meant to the rest of the world. So I started to photograph my experiences and kind of look at these experiences and bring one or two conversations about my life and my journey and about these experiences as well that I face. That's amazing. I mean, to be honest, when I first saw your work, that's what jumped out at me is that your paintings of a, of these different people are all, like say, one of them will be in all red and but tonally painted beautifully. And then we'll have eye holes that are black and white cut out, almost like they're wearing a balaclava or something. And it just, it sort of speaks of looking outward and then seeing people... Yeah. Yeah, sort of seeing you, like identifying you differently than you would have seen yourself when you're just a person looking outward, but then you're part of a, you know, a kind of pigeonholed group for other communities, which is uh, just a, you know, a kind of a, I don't know, I think it's quite a disappointing thing to see how people can just put you into boxes and marginalise you uh, in ways. Um, but it's just such beautiful work as well. It's not... Um, it's not anything which is in any way visually unpleasant. It's such a beautiful patchwork of bright and uh, amazing colours and lovely paintings. And I'm curious about your show Migrant that you mentioned from 2022, I think, or yeah. 20, yeah. Um, this uh, arrangement of boxes that you've done in different countries, yeah. did you did you kind of play with the arrangement or the colour combination or did you always have a set pattern that you'd arrange it in? Uh, I always let, most times I let the curators um, decide what the work should be. And so they, they kind of arrange it in a very interesting way all the time. Uh, in Berlin, the curator kind of handled that. In um, France, in Paris, um, Roger Carrera, who is the curator in, of 193 Gallery at that time, um, he, you know, decided how it should be. And I just leave it to people to kind of, decide what the you know how the structure should be because for me it's like i've made the building blocks and um it's left for somebody to build the house or build the structure um i've had really really um incredible ideas uh to use it to make a house or use it to make like a space but and these are things i'm kind of still working on and working towards but for now i just let them do you know what they think is uh exciting to them and is kind of and kind of fits in the show mm, yeah i mean it must be fascinating to see how people arrange these colored boxes in their own way it probably speaks to the psychology of either the person or the country where it's uh, a different culture that's interpreting how to arrange this to speak to the audience which must be fascinating for you yeah, and I, and I also realized that some other some curators like look back and and like another person's uh, structure, and then they kind of copy that. And uh, for me, I like it. Um, uh, I've never had the two hundred boxes all together. I've always had them scattered all over the the, the world. But it would be good to have you know, one show where all of them are together and see what you know, the kind of structures that these people make, um, I think is an exciting project. Uh, aside just it being visually striking, is also a representation of many immigrants around the world because now we have a very huge story about immigration. And um, 
um, and what it can do to communities and to people individually. So it's a, it's a timeless um, conversation, honestly. Yeah, no, that's very true. Uh, and I think I saw on one of the videos that uh, you're more described as well as a storyteller who um, speaks uh, of communities that are unified by um, by a kind of common um, uh, a kind of a common kind of narrative in a way of their own journey and experience of you know being in a foreign land, trying to make themselves a home and and their experiences there and how you're you're kind of privileged to have their stories shared with you. Yeah. Is does this really does this inform your artwork as you as you make it of them? Yeah. Um you know, we just talk, you know, as people, we just like hang out and talk. And you know, some conversations can spark up an idea, you know. And sometimes uh the people when I ask them for their because the boxes as well. I don't take the pictures. I just ask them to send me a selfie that they've taken. So it's very random and it's very, and it's more connected to what they want to be represented as, you know? So it's a very interesting project when you look at the process of making it. But in that process of them sending me the boxes, they're like, oh, this is my face. You know, I got rejected seven times to the US and I'm like, whoa, but now I'm in Canada, you know, and I have to switch. And you hear another person, oh, this is my face. You know, I've, you know, I've been here, but I had to rush back to Nigeria because Nigeria was home. So all of these stories that I hear, um, I like, I really appreciate, you know, them sharing to them to me. And it makes the work a lot more um, interesting. And that's why I try. Um, earlier in the work, I was making these paintings of the faces very quick so that it almost feels like you're printing on boxes in some way. So they were not looking like the subject enough. Uh, but um, closer to last year, I started to pay more attention to in representing the people exactly how they look. Because these days I see, you know, you see this structure and then somebody is there and it's like, oh, that's my face, you know, I'm, I'm part of the boxes. And that, I, I like that feeling that I'm able to put very regular random people in gallery spaces and hopefully in museums one day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was I'm fascinated by the idea of receiving a selfie from the people because, I mean, people are notoriously not, good at taking pictures of themselves or anything that they want painting. So that must have been tricky for you to interpret initially. Has that changed at all? Or are you still, are you, have you kind of, you know, uh, developed this into um, how they should take the selfie or do you take any pictures now, or is it still receiving their own uh, way of photographing themselves? Um, it's still the same. It's still the same way. It's still, um, it's still people sending me selfies. Uh, like the work, I, I don't sell the boxes, so um, I'm not. I'm not trying to sell their image to anyone. Um, but it's just for the conversation to be to be made. Um, so it's still the same way. I I really like that they send me something uh, rather than me going to take a picture of it, because sometimes you you have them send you without makeup. Sometimes you have them take the picture at that moment when I ask them to, you know, and um, that changes the work. That changes the way I look at the work, honestly. Uh, I get really excited to anticipating for the picture they send me. Some people send me like three or four and they say, pick one, you know, and I try to pick the one that kind of fits into the structure of the boxes. So the way I crop the faces, I make it so personal. And some of them, I have the cut out eyes and that, that part is random. I just pick the people who I feel, oh, I'm looking directly at camera and they have this striking um, feeling that I want to capture. But sometimes I also pick people who have a strong story as well. Um, I remember this this incredible guy who traveled to US and became joined the Marines in the US. And 
he was just telling me about his journey and how difficult it was and how he was, you know, stereotyped while being in the Marines till before he broke through. And uh, now he's, you know, done some things that he's gotten a bit more respect in the space. And I just like that that story of accomplishment and 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 breakthrough. And I wanted to capture it through his eyes. So different um, reasons for the different um, choices that I make in the work but all in all I, I love that they send me their selfies I don't want to I don't want to decide what I would take for them I like them I like the pictures I like the thing that the pictures are what the person really is what the person really likes because for a selfie you have to look at yourself you know, taking the picture. So that's the first time you actually want to know exactly how you look like and you picture yourself how you want to look like. So it's kind of fun to to do that. That's really interesting. Yeah, I love that. And it's, you know, the idea of having this um, single colour for each box and then tonally develop it to show the person. Has that been something which um, you've always done or is it an idea that you developed over time? Um. I, I used to take it back to this painting, um, the portrait of the art, a portrait of the artist and the shadow of his former self by Kerry Marshall. Uh, when I saw the painting, it was like a black paint head canvas. But when you go closer, you start seeing the tonal values of the black, you know, kind of make the shape of the face. And I was kind of fascinated about that, um, that, you know, you, it looks like one color when you look up so far, but when you start coming close, it starts to form in some way. Um, so I wanted to play with that in the boxes. Um, so I wanted to, and then I wanted to play with African colors as well, red, orange, yellow, blue, you know, all the colors that you'd see on the roadside in Nigeria or when you go to Ghana, when you go to South Africa. Uh, so for me, it's, it became, how can I play with the way Kenji's Marshall is playing with his or use colors? Because I'm not really, I'm not really, I don't really fancy black, <laughs> black paint, right? I, I always use black just for the eyes and because I use charcoal to draw the eyes. So, um, it, and charcoal in some way is, is you know, is earthy. You know, so it kind of feels like life in some sense. Um, but the painting, I want it to be like these different colors, you know, the blue, the red, the yellow, the green. And I want when you look back, far back, it looks like just like beautiful colors, almost like a fabric. But when you come closer, you start to see these faces on the boxes. Yeah, no, it is. It really works that way. It's beautiful. Um but I've also seen that you've uh, had a book, uh, Promise Boys, and yeah. that's really interesting. I mean, would you be able to tell us anything about that book at all? Yeah, it's uh, it's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an incredible book. It's about three young boys who um wanted to dis wanted to decipher who committed a crime in school. And it just takes you through this um, story of this um, African Indian boy um, who, you know, had to go through all of the difficulties and figure out who was the killer. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a thriller kind of um, novel. But one thing that really, when they reached out to me, one thing that really caught my attention is um, the representation um, how to represent these people um, and how to represent them in a striking way that just the cover itself can give you a sense of what the book is about. And uh, we went back and forth. It was a, it was a long process, honestly. It took like almost months uh, for me to come up with this idea of um, having this one person and these two profiled guys and then the main character who is, uh forgotten his name, so quite a long time I did the book, uh, like two years ago. But the main character has the eyes because he's basically the one telling the story of um, the whole, um, yeah, of the whole, um, um, of all the things that happened inside the book. So it's a, I like, I like, I love the, I love the book. It's kind of one of the things that made me realize that my art can exist in so many places. And till now, people see the book and, you know, they are attracted by the cover. And then they want to see what what the book is all about. Yeah, 
No, it is. It's amazing. It's really striking. And you've got a perfect style to make it very intriguing and insightful about, again, you know, uh, seeing someone's uh, kind of perspective looking out at the world, which is, uh, it's just lovely how that it's almost a simple concept it is kind of makes it even greater a message that you can put out there really, which is uh, lovely. I, I love that. But yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, because you're, um, you use mixed media, you use charcoal, and is it mainly acrylic otherwise that you use as paint, or do you use all sorts of paints? Yeah, I use acrylic, I use oil, I use charcoal. A painting can have the three different ideas um, work. Um, my my biggest goal in some way um, when I use these materials is that these materials kind of reflect light in different ways. Charcoal doesn't reflect light that much because it's a um, it's um charcoal. It's, and uh, acrylic reflects light just a bit. Oil really reflects light. So if I'm trying to make like a three-dimensional illusion in some way, or I'm trying to make the painting kind of glow in a way, you know, I have to pay attention to what this how these materials reflect light. And I have to start playing with, you know, you know, how the composition kind of works in some way. So I, I really want to use more materials. I want to use um, I want to use materials that have texture as well. Um, but that's um, that's for my new body of work. But for now, it's more of like how can I use all these materials that kind of reflect light differently, and how can that change the composition of the work? So it's for me, it's just for the for the aesthetics of it, you know, for the beauty of it. And not just the beauty in some way, because the charcoal kind of represents life in some way. It's coming from tree and nature. Um, the acrylic paint is uh, more like a modern kind of paint. The oil, oil paint was the first, you know, was the oldest kind of paint. And when oil paint was invented, which is, it was used to paint realistic works. Um, look at the the works of the days um, of um, um, the Da Vinci's and people who used oil paint, and then acrylic paint was a much earlier paint that was used for abstract work during the abstract time. And so, for me, I try to still keep some part of the culture history of the paint, but still find a way to come make it work for me. That's lovely. Yeah, and. With you mentioning earlier about not being as keen to use black paint, because um, obviously you can, you've been inspired by the painting in black and the tonal values yeah. that you can represent in that, but you've made it your own in color and only use charcoal for the black and white section, which is powerful and makes perfect sense. I'm wondering if there's any other rules that you follow of your own for your own work. I mean, obviously, you've mentioned about the reflection of light by oil, and that's a great kind of rule of how the paint works that you follow. But is there anything where you think, I'll never do this or I'll always do this because for you it makes sense? Because it's interesting to see where artists find preference in um, practices with paint. So is there anything like that you can think of that you do? Uh, I used to think I'm never going to not paint eyes, but recently I started to um, not really care about if the subject is looking eye to eye anymore. Um, I feel like the paint itself um, does more of the energy, the work. Um, um, but now I just this leave these few things that I've been able to, I always make my palette. Like I, I buy like one color and I take white and black and I start to build the shade and the gradient and start to chop it up. And then I make it into like a, a cone and then I cover that and I make another color. Um, I'm very used to that because when I started out, I started with charcoal drawings. Now uh, charcoal drawings was more of light and dark, shadow and highlight. So when I transitioned into painting, um, I started to do the, you know, the representing skin the way it is, you know, with the world the way it is. Then I just thought, well, I could use the same 
the same mindset that I used to do my charcoal work. And then I fell in love with Kerry James Marshall's work. And I was like, well, it's a no-brainer. Um, I need to adopt this way into my own practice. And aside that, I think that's just um, that's just all I've been kind of doing. Not nothing really. Everything changes, doesn't it? It just depends on where you are at that moment and what you think is an exciting to you as an artist. I've yeah. always used my practice if you've seen my works in 2020 to 2019. There's always a change. There's always a good grad, well, very slow change, but it's happening and you can feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's a it's a healthy way to kind of step forward and progress, isn't it? So um I'm curious as why you initially didn't want to paint eyes. Where where did that come from? <laughs> well, uh, I came to London and I just liked the idea of me, me being anonymous. Uh, back in Nigeria, I was um, a bit um, popular, maybe not as popular as the musicians, but um, I'd go to a place and at least one person would know me. So um, there was no hiding kind of in Nigeria. But coming to London, nobody really cared who I was um, and what I had done. And... I just wanted to see what I could do aside people looking, staring at you eye to eye, even though I still put it in my in my practice, but I wanted to know what else can I talk about, you know? What else can I bring from this whole composition? Uh, what if I wanted to paint hands or legs or like shoes or, you know? And, you know, the idea that um, the conversation is what is important, not the style, of making the work mm. i think that kind of um especially going to the real college of art and you know realizing that you know so after so many tutorials and um quit quit sessions that you know the work was not the representation the, the work was not the style sorry sorry the work was in the message yeah. so whatever message i want to I want to tackle or I want to talk about. Um, if it doesn't need the eye necessarily, I just do that do it without it. Um, but if it needs people to kind of connect with the viewers, then I'll do it with the eyes. Um and in my latest um my my just finished my just completed an exhibition and Ber in Berlin, all of them had the eyes because it was more about connecting with these people and connecting with them, you know because they were at home when I took the pictures. I went back to Nigeria, I took some pictures in Nigeria of people being at home. And I wanted to represent that. And I felt, you know, nah, people have to dialogue with you eye to eye. They have to see it eye to eye, you know? But sometimes it's just, you know, more exciting to, you know, think of other ways to represent um, what my message is or what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I just, I wasn't aware of that. And I have heard that you say, so I am going to ask you about this, if you're comfortable talking about it. I've heard you say about that you almost lost one of your eyes at one point. Yes, I did. I almost did. That, that you see the down, it's like kind of, um, yeah, I almost did. It was a crazy moment. Um, uh, I love my dad, he's passed away now, but um I was young when it happened. Uh, I was, my brother was chasing me, sorry. My brother was chasing me in the house and I was running, you know, trying to find, um, trying to find um, a place to dock or hide. Uh, it was a game we were playing, like uh, it's called catcher. So if I catch you, you know, I, I, then you catch me now. I, they call it tag. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. call it tag, yeah. So I ran to my mom's room and the door handle of the room just snapped my eye and drew me back like it was bad. Like I, I, I put my hand like this and I could feel something on my hand. And I, I went crazy. I thought it was my eye I was feeling, which probably could be, you know. My mom went crazy. It was midnight. My dad was just leaving the hospital in Nigeria. You know that there's no light, so there's no electric. There was no electricity, um, so she rushed me straight to the hospital. 
my dad used um, a candle, you know, like fire, like candle to actually do the operation, and they had to close my eye. Now it was it was wild. Uh, I felt the pain so much, uh, but what happened was that when that happened, I started to. You know, I started to heal, but when I st when he started to heal, my eyes was a bit bigger, you mm. know, and how it was supposed to be. So I got mocked in school and and kind of ridiculed for my eye, like ah, you look like Cyclops, you know. <laughs> <laughs> my eye would get red when I don't wear my glasses, so it was so bad. Um, it was really bad, but then. You know, my mom will always tell me that the eye is the gateway to the soul, you know, that the bigger the eye, the bigger the dream, you know, and uh, and so sometimes she will, I'll look at the mirror and I'll complain and she'll look at me through the mirror and she, I can remember the image all, all the time and she'll look at me on the, in the mirror and say, look at how beautiful your eye is, you know. And I'd get that confidence back and I'll go to school and then I get really good and I come back going, ah, <laughs> she does it again and again. So the eye became a very strong part of my journey as a person. And when I became an artist, I was so moved to painting the eye a lot because where, where it started from, it started without me knowing that I'm painting the eye a lot. To someone said, yo, bro, you're painting the eye a lot. <laughs> and I started to say, and I started thinking, and I'm like, well, it's a no-brainer. Like, the eye has always been part of my journey. So um, if the fact that I can understand eyes and I can, you know, paint it well, and I can also paint it in such a way that it becomes really emotional, um, people really connect with the work, and it makes the subject almost feel real. You know, like there's there's a there's a there's there's a much more real part of this subject than painting. It's not just a painting of of a random person. This person actually lives somewhere in the world and is going through that thing that I'm painting. Um, I think that was what fascinated me about painting the eyes. But it started from the from the from the injury to the all the shit talk yeah. <laughs> and to me actually owning up to it and saying, yo, this is mine. I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. And so many times, you know, the universe has tried to take out my eye. Like I've had like injuries and injuries and injuries. Like I've had like four injuries just at this section, just mm -hmm. trying to take out the eye, you know, but <laughs> yeah, but we, we struggled and we'll fight it through, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you've you've kept hold of it. And, and your dad sounds amazing doing the surgery. Your mum sounds amazing giving you that amazing advice of uh, you know the eyes being the window to the soul, and the the larger the eyes, the the larger the kind of the soul speaking through. And uh, but was your was your mum or dad were they artistic at all? Did you get no? No, my my dad um, my dad was my dad painted nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when, like, when we told my dad, my dad used to do this stuff with the Y O U. So he put Y O U, and then he connected U, and then connected this thing, and then it forms like a cartoon face. <laughs> uh, my mom was was the worst, worst. Now my mom never even attempted to paint. Okay, my mom told us this stuff where it's like uh, small circle, small circle, big circle. Yeah, mama, yeah, papa, small triangle. <laughs> This is nice. It's 36 years. Yeah, it was a, yeah, an old nosy wine to make like a teddy bear. <laughs> but they never, never, never really knew how to paint. Uh, so we didn't even know where it came from because my brother was the one that started painting first in the family. Okay. And he would sell it in school, in his primary school. That's how amazing it was. He would sell it in his primary school. And I would look at him and I'd be like, oh, that's a good painting, you know? He used to paint like pop of girls and like, you know? And uh, yeah, we just kind of forgot about it. It wasn't anything. And then I, I from secondary school to university, I failed my jam at first. So I stayed one year at home where I decided to look for a job and worked in a bookstore. And I was working in a bookstore. I was really bored. I started, I started trying out these new different things. I, I play chess. Uh, I played Scrabble. That's when I started getting good at chess and Scrabble. 
Um, I'll play the Ruby's Cube. Oh, it's Ruby's Cube, but yeah, I think so. I I played so many things, but one thing that I, I started doing was to draw. I started to draw, and I draw cartoons and weird things, like just randomly. Um, so getting getting into my university, my first year, I still do these cartoons and caricatures of my lecturers that everybody will laugh. <laughs> so eventually, I someone told me, "Yo, there's this guy painting." this incredible drawing of the Dean of Unilag. And I went there and I saw the drawing and I saw the painting and I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to draw like that and I want to make art. And throughout the years, I've just been really excited about the new things I learned about art, you know, the new ideas, the new things I see, you know, I'm excited about it. It's not just about realism anymore. It's not about representation anymore. It's just about feeling and enjoying that feeling and creating things that you just feel like, oh, this can pass the message I want to pass, you know, and just uh, having fun, you know, because mm. if you don't have fun doing what you're doing, then you would eventually get burnt out. At the end so if but you have fun doing it you will always do it for the rest of your life yeah that's great advice yeah i love that and your new painting as well that i've seen your one of your latest is amazingly textured work that has this kind of flow running through it can you talk about how you do your painting process is there do you leave it very wet and then move it or how do you do that yeah so um i during my study at the RCA, I was privileged to go with um, a, a community called RCA Black, BLK. And it was really a very, it was a good, good community. Really. Uh, we went for so many things. We went for so many, uh, we went to see so many exhibitions. But one, one, one I was very, very particular about was when they told us we're going to go to Frank Bowling Studio. And I was like, holy yes, because I love his work, right? I've seen it in museums, I've seen it in galleries. I want to go to that studio. And then I went to the studio and I saw the paintings. I saw how it was made. It was, I thought paintings were sacred, but he put his painting on the floor and Paul, you know, used water for his brushes on the painting. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, that's interesting. So there's no rule on what to do in the painting, in the, in the work in some way. You had, if you had this idea, you could just do it. You know, if it was going to represent what you wanted to represent, you could just do it. And immediately I just got this excitement to want to do abstract work. You know, so I went, came back to the studio, bought on my canvas, putting on the floor and I just stared to pour paint on the on the canvas. And when I pour paint on the canvas, you know, I move the canvas just when it's wet. You know, so it fills the the canvas. And then sometimes I leave it and then it's a bit dry. But you still it's not too dry. It's still like kind of thick. And then when you move it again, it gives a different kind of a mix and a different kind of layer. And then I started to use different paints and have these paintings mix in the canvas. So I don't mix them on my palette like I do the realism. But I, I mix them on the canvas. So I want, and I started to see that, oh, you know, I, if I bought a color book, I bought a color book that kind of shows me, oh, if I mix that, that could come, that could become a very cool color. So I just put like blue, green or blue, yellow, I mix the blue, yellow, that turns to green, put like red, mix the blue with the red, that turns to purple, the yellow with the red, that turns to orange. So all of this mix is just happening. So the canvas became my palette. You know, I was making, I was making the color gradient on the canvas. And I couldn't necessarily direct what it would, what would happen. You know, I was just playing with it. And it was just giving me, it just kept giving me something that um, sometimes I might not like, but sometimes I would just love it. I would love the effect. Um, and then when I was done doing all of that for the first work, I knew that it wasn't complete because, yeah, it's, I love abstract, but 
there was still something missing at work. And so I just started to see, think of what I could paint on the work and how that could elevate the, the meaning of the work. So that kind of started my whole journey of this new body of work and this new practice that I'm doing now. Yeah, that piece that I've seen on your account looks amazing because you've got all this movement and liquid flow on a layer. And then a layer above that, you've got these kind of flatter layers that are really nicely kind of, you know, built up. And then a character again, that's, you know, very much just screams your style. That's just yeah. beautiful. And it's very powerful to have it laid on top of each other because you can see how much um, kind of uh, texture there is on the surface and different, different levels of texture where it's kind of, you know, really built up in certain areas. And then it's kind of really um, kind, of, like, kind of flat surface on another. And it just, it looks very kind of tactile kind of work where I think it'd be difficult for people to view your work without wanting to put their okay. fingerprints on it. You know? I, 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 I completely agree with you on that. I, I really want them. I, well, I don't I know it's not, but I really want a situation where people can touch the work. Um, but it's something I, I'm thinking of the future, you know, put a lot of texture in the work and play with some new materials to kind of push out these textures. Because uh, while in the IOC as well, I used to make flat surface, flat paintings, but while in the IOC, there was this oh, incredible artist. I like saying incredible artist, but she is incredible. Her name is Kimberly and she is blind. So she can't see, but she makes beautiful paintings. And we had this great session where she wanted to see the paintings, but she could only feel them. And I was kind of sad because she couldn't feel my painting. And they'll tell her, oh, that's the face, you know? And I wanted her to feel my painting and I wanted everyone to feel my painting. I remember seeing as well, seeing um, this post by, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, forgotten his name. Uh, one of his exhibitions, he was showing uh, someone who was blind, his sculpture, and he would tell them to touch it. And he, the person would kind of feel the sculpture and be like, oh, that's a crystal. Oh, that's this. Oh, that's that. You know, it just it sparked the interest in me to make the work, like make it almost three-dimensional, that people could feel it. And from that feeling, they get excited about the paintings, you know? Because in a in a normal surface, you feel a wall and it's just flat. You know, you feel something and it's just patterns. But in an artwork, you know, you put your hand here and it, it's bumpy and it put here and it's so flat and it put here. So that kind of um, excited me to to kind of make works that has a, a lot of texture. And uh, I'd one day want people to just, you know, go ahead and just feel the work and enjoy feeling the work. So can you see yourself working more and more unorthodox practices into your work as you progress? Because it seems as though you're kind of exploring and discovering new ways to connect with people beyond just the visual level. Is that is that fair to, to say? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's why I call myself a multidisciplinary artist now and not just, really just a visual artist because I... I like to play with different things now, sculptures, um, installations, um, um, lights, uh, colors, um, digital as well. I, I like to make, I like to create an experience, you know? And once you are, in, once you are, uh, once you partake in an experience, you never forget it, especially when it's a good experience, you know? And, I'm not a fan of the very quiet, you know, exhibitions where it's just a painting, like we just quiet and why, and everybody's just sipping champagne. I'm not a fan of that. I like that because that kind of shows like, oh, you're a bad, you're a very good artist, but I mean, not good artist, but you're a very big artist, you know. Yeah. But I'm not a fan of that. I like people to go back and say, oh man, I went to that show, and. I enjoyed myself, you know, I saw this and I saw that and I saw this and I want people to be proud of the fact that they went to the show or they went for the exhibition and I know it's going to happen one day, you know, I remember, um, I remember 
going to see Kendrick Lamar when he just started, but he came, no, J. Cole, sorry, when he came to Lagos. And every time I see his concert, I'm telling my friend, yo, man, he came to Lagos some time ago and I was there and it was crazy. You know, when you have a good experience, you never forget it. So for me, I'm just trying to create an experience. Um, it might, I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how it's going to, I never know what, whether it's good or bad, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure to some people it's a bad experience, you know, but um, if it's good to me, I know that it will be good to some people as well. Uh, so I'm just trying so hard to make an experience that one, people have not really experienced before. And even if they have, they've, they are experiencing it in a new perspective. Um, so that's that's just it for me. Yeah. Well, if I can go to your materials as well, because... Uh... <clears throat> because we've talked a little bit about the paint that you use. If, I mean, it sounds as though you've experimented a bit with how acrylic and oil mix when they're wet as well. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah? Uh, well, no, so I don't use, I use oil for my realism, for the paintings of the people and the hands and the, and the body and, and like maybe like the table or something like that, but the acrylic just specifically for the abstract work uh, because I don't have time to wait for oil to dry. Oil is so annoying. So I started using oil just last year. Uh, I've been running away from oil for so long. Uh, I started using oil last year when I realized that, okay, the background has to be acrylic now. So I have to think of, you know, what else to add to it. And I just like, I like to think of my work like structure, like, I think that came from my civil engineering practice as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I build my practice? How can I structure it in such a way that, you know, it's sustainable? You know, I can I can keep doing it the same thing, but in different ways. And when you see the body of work, they kind of meet in some way. Um, so for me, that's just how I, I see it. Uh, if, you, if you watch... Uh, if you watch... Uh, let me was it watch last and watch. Uh, yeah, if you watch a movie by a specific director, you know you can tell, you know what the movie is about. Maybe like Claire, uh, Quentin Tarantino, you yeah. can tell what the movie is about. You can tell it's about the Italian mafia. You can tell about it's this and that. So I want people to see my work and tell like okay. There is kind of a structure around it, but it, it can come in different forms and in different ways. Um, so for me, I don't I don't mix the acrylic and oil. I just let the acrylic be the abstract, and I let the oil be the reality, and I let the charcoal be the soul of the person. Yeah. And I know that as time goes on, I start playing with the new materials. Even there's one I did not long ago. I played it like a fabric on the canvas, and I kind of glued the fabric on the canvas, and it was like a kitchen rag yeah. and your mind when i saw it in london i was like oh wow that reminds me of when i was younger you know my mom used to use that kitchen rag as well so i wanted to use it in the work to kind of talk about home and belonging as well so different materials are going to come into my work but all in all it's just to kind of you know make exciting works and make works that people can enjoy and have an experience of mm. well one of the things that we do as a section on the podcast that we take interest in is um, people's color palette. And we ask if you, if you have a set palette, if you can take us through all of the colors that you use each one. So uh, yeah. yeah. Can you do that? If you have, do you have a set? Uh, I have, I have a set palette. Uh, do you want me to bring it now? Or yeah, do you yeah, please. If, if okay. you don't mind, if that's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm so cheeky. <laughs> it should have been one of my warnings before we started recording is okay so yeah just kind of yeah so uh so for the acrylic, these these are the small tubes for the yeah. acrylic. Uh, I like to use primary blue, uh, and turquoise. Turquoise is one of my best colors. 
candium red, candium yellow, candium orange, uh, sorry, primary yellow, and ultramarine is also one of my favorite colors as well. Uh, so I just all of these I just kind of pour it in a in a tube, mix water, mix one or two things, pour it on the canvas, and like they kind of mix. And for my my images, um. I use a lot of candium yellow hue. I mean, chrome yellow hue, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thing. That's like chrome yellow hue. Yeah. And what I do is uh, for the for the skin, I kind of mix it with charcoal gray and a little white as well. So that creates the gradient between the yellow. And for the, for the other parts of the image, I like to use the... Candium orange hue, and then mix it with the candium red hue, and also the chrome yellow hue, and that kind of gives the orange gradient. So there's a yellow gradient and there's an orange gradient, and kind of break it down. So yeah, just yeah, how I thought about these colors, I don't know how I thought about it. I just I think I just kind of saw. Uh, do I have any thermal? <laughs> image yeah i think i just um i was excited about thermal these thermal images that i was taking and i decided you know what i need to see the colors that kind of match these colors and so i i printed the image out and i went to the store and i started to look at all the colors and i check if that color matches and I, oh yeah that matches and that matches and that matches and i kind of came to the studio and made the painting so um so yeah it's uh it's a it's a small color it's not the acrylic is is it can range you know i can get purple and pink into play but for the images i like to keep it just small just with the candiums and the chrome mm. and you didn't i noticed there wasn't a, a blue on the oil paint do you not? No, have a no, I don't. I don't. I don't do uh, blue and oil paint. I'm. I'm actually thinking of it. So, uh, it might be a future future work because uh, someone said something to me. He said, uh, "In as much as you're talking about energy, you know, which is life, but they can be death as well." And when you think of the thermal imaging colors, you know that blue and purple and black represents death. Mm. So in some way, it might come into my work. But for now, I'm I'm very excited to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to hear the thought process behind the colors as well, because I didn't realize that's it's representing the heat signature as well through the thermal imagery. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, that's brilliant. You see the work and you, you think of life, you think of our sun, you know, yeah. of energy, you know, and shall be in London where everything feels blue, everything feels cold. <laughs> you, know, you need a bit of, of brightness and light. Yeah. I come to my studio and my studio feels hot all the time. And uh, I think it's because of the colors. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You'd be able to sell your work easily if you like say, this is heat of your house. Just buy this warm work. You know, <laughs> like give you some heat. <laughs> yeah. I was at the point I started playing with um, thermographic colors, yeah. thermochromic colors. So they are colors that when you touch with your hand and if contact when you contact when it's uh when it's heat sensitive, it changes color. Oh Let's wow! Show you that. Yeah, I've got to see that. This is fascinating. <laughs> this is why I've got to be cheeky and ask these questions. <laughs> inside of knowledge it's amazing okay so yeah so so that is a uh, oh. so if i do that uh let me just find the place you see oh that? wow yeah oh that's amazing yeah so that is <laughs> that is one of my that's one of the things I'm kind of studying to yeah. make new paintings um, in such a way that when it's cold in London, it becomes orange. And when it's hot in London, it becomes yellow. Um, the really sad part about the what the paint, the paint pigment is that I think it lasts for like five years or six years. Mm. Um, 
but I'm still working on it. I'm still kind of contacting the the people who made it and see what's possible and how we can increase the the lasting time. Yeah. Even just for the paintings that I kind of make. Yeah. I mean, surely for the majority of the time in London, won't it be cold? You don't have to <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, put it, the hands on it, warm enough. <laughs> but imagine taking the work then to maybe somewhere in Africa and then just oh, take yeah. color. You know, yeah. imagine putting it close to the heater and then it just kind of changes color. Um yeah. so much uh the work can be um uh, and there's so many so many ideas I'm I'm kind of thinking of what the work should be, even as I just a painting, but like an installation. That that you know plays with light, um, that plays with heat and cold, and finding a way to you know make the installation work. So I have so many ideas, and it's so difficult to create ideas in London than it is in Nigeria. Nigeria is quite easy because you get the resources very cheap. Here in London, it can can be so expensive to to build an idea and and to even find a storage space to keep those ideas. So, but yeah, I'm I'm strongly, strongly hoping that you know I get to release all of these ideas eventually. You know, yeah. in the future. Well, do you apply for grants? Because I've been through that process of applying for grant money in order to create a show that can then travel around. That's not necessarily commercial work. Is that what you're going through at the moment? I don't know if I should say that here, but I'm 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 a very bad um I I I do really bad in applications. <laughs> okay. I do really bad in applications. Um I don't know why. They're hard I, though. They're, I, they're not a pleasant process. Yeah. They're not a pleasant process. I used to feel like they always have who they want to give it to. Yeah. And I'm just part of the people just making the, the numbers increase and become more. Um I always believe in the idea that's who when it's time, it's time to make the work. You know, I, I have everything most times sketched out. Um and I just wait slowly for the time when it's time is time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a meeting with a an agent, like a grant officer, who gives you advice on how to complete it. I don't know if you've been through that, but that'd be worth inquiring about because that gave me a bit more of an insight into how to interpret the form because sometimes you've got to understand what they're asking for in order to provide you know the necessary requirements to be become eligible for the grants which is uh it's it's difficult to try and navigate that process isn't it true true please you you'd recommend the book i'd like to read it (laughs) (laughs) well i'll speak to you after the interview about about what i know um but yeah so because you're creating non-commercial work you know you're saying that it's not for sale yeah is this how do you how do you present this to galleries and how do you find spaces to exhibit um it's a very strong question Oof, this is a very strong question because someone once messaged someone was wrote an article about my work and said well if it's so socially impactful why is it shown in the context of commercial in the context of commercial in commercial spaces and why is it shown with other works that are now for sale so what i do is that when i have an exhibition of my work which is for sale i like to include the boxes which is not for sale to in a way still bring the migrant experience in these spaces so it's like i'm cheating the system in some way and kind of just be taking the boxes to the different places but uh, just a response to what that person said and also to exp- to 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 speak about what you've asked um i just feel like you know i take every opportunity to to talk about what i want to talk about you know um the paintings are for sale obviously but the boxes are very much not for sale um but I always find different ways to bring it out to public and to let people see it. Because when you think of a gallery space or a fair, everyone wants to sell the work, you know? Uh, but I've been very 
strong in um, letting people know that you know the work the boxes are kind of not for sale, and uh, because they they kind of represent something larger and better and bigger than what than somebody picking out one person. That means you've taken out somebody from the community and put it in your house. And that doesn't look that doesn't sound nice, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's always good to leave them, you know, together, you know, stacked yeah. up together. Or maybe bring them in twos, but they are still kind of have they can they kind of have these different communities. Um yeah, but the goal is one to keep showing the boxes everywhere I show. Every exhibition I have, I want to put a bit of the boxes in it. Two, to keep painting immigrants around the world. Go to Italy, paint immigrants there. Go to Japan, paint immigrants there. Go to US, paint immigrants there. I want a whole, and I put their names, I write their names in the boxes and you know their age as well, just so that it gives a better a, almost like a profile of of these different people and these different immigrants and you know it's good to have the collection of immigrants you know in one space in one catalog you know in some way um so yeah so it's an exciting project and i think it's it's kind of difficult to find funding for it or to to find different grants for it because many grants as well, they want something that can, you know, be sold or that they can have something after the whole, you know, event or the whole, and, and everything you're doing, they need something to say, okay, we gave you the grant. You know, actually residences as well, after the whole painting, they want one painting for themselves. So it's kind of difficult to find um, opportunities, but it's something I'm I'm always looking towards, and it it will it works it works from it works in some way it works in some way. But I always find a way to show the yeah. the boxes, even no matter how crooked it is, I will find a way to show it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And how many galleries are you currently showing in? Are you showing in a lot of galleries? And if so, what what are the names? It's just so that people, if they are watching from around the world or listening from around the world. But they may be local enough to go and visit one of the galleries. Where should they go to see your work? Uh, currently, um, you'd see my work uh, in Berlin, uh, Christine Jelleged Gallery. Um, I work with them. I've worked with them for like a year. Incredible gallery. Lovely lady who, who is the gallerist. Um, and I think I find a lot of... Um, I find a good opportunity to express myself, you know, with, with them, you know, rather than some galleries that are just very profit oriented and they just want, you know, just give us something that's going to make some money. <laughs> you know, I get to be free in expressing myself. Uh, for now, that's just it. Um, I'm hoping to have uh, some exhibitions in New York and soon. That's not been released yet. Um, I think I have a fundraiser with House and Wealth in London, um, and yeah, some other some other uh, places that they can see my work. But always, I always post it on my Instagram, so uh, it's always good for them to just follow me on Instagram or follow my website and maybe sign up to the newsletter. And I always like um, my team will always send newsletters about where I am and what my works in and where my works are. That's fantastic. I mean, my next question was going to be about the online platform. So Instagram, your website and your newsletters on your website and all of the uh, I'll be showing on screen for any video watchers uh, images of all of these places. And in the description of the video and the audio platforms, I'll have links for the gallery, for the website, for your um, your online social media platforms. And I really encourage everyone to go and see and support your work because it's beautiful work you're an amazing person i really appreciate how generous you've been to come on the podcast thank you uh thank you so much it was um, it was a, it was a really interesting podcast i liked it thank you so much
Well, we hope you enjoyed that episode. If you can support the podcast by leaving a like or a comment down below, that would really be great. But what we'd really like is if you're able to leave a review on the podcast channels, wherever you listen to it or download it, because that helps us get spread around the internet so that more people have access to us and able to see what we're making. Also, follow us on Instagram, and we'd really appreciate it if you like and engage with our posts. Help get the podcast better known. Thanks for listening.